Hello, we're starting now our fourth session. And it's, we're skipping way ahead now to unit four, session 21. And so the picture you'll see will um, be of a stained glass window with Jesus on the cross. If you open to that screen, or if you're looking in your workbook, it's page 181. It's called The Paschal Mystery, and it's unit four, session 21. And now we're getting directly into our preparation for Holy Communion, for this great event, which is just a little bit more than a month away now. October 17th is the big date, so we're preparing our hearts for this great, great gift. And let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these students who are learning more about you so that they can receive Jesus Christ into their own bodies, that they can become one body with him in your blessed Roman Catholic Church. And I ask that you would give them hearts on fire with love for the gospel and on love for, on love for the blessed Trinity the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I ask you, blessed mother, that you would share with us your faith, your hope, and your love for God to prepare us for this, these very great events of confirmation and First Holy Communion. And we, we pray a Hail Mary together now. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, come by means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse. All you holy angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, today we're going to talk about how Jesus redeemed us. We talked about how Adam and Eve committed original sin, how they brought death, suffering, and sin into the world. But now we're going to talk about what was the remedy? Like, how did Jesus, the new Adam, and Mary, the new Eve, how did they bring life and um, holiness back into the world? Like, we can think about, we talked about how God created the whole world with his word that he breathed the, the universe into existence through Jesus Christ, through his only, only begotten son. But we also can think about how the Holy Spirit, at the beginning, of, when we read the beginning of Genesis, how it talked about there was a mighty wind stirring over the water. And that word in, in Hebrew is ruah, which is the same word for spirit. So the Holy Spirit brought, brought order into the chaos of, of the original the original nothingness God brought into being elements and then he brought the universe into being. So, so we think about all these things, but the Paschal mystery specifically means God, Jesus became a man, which was the incarnation, and he, he suffered, died, rose from the dead, and ascended into heaven. That's the Paschal mystery, his, his passion, which is his sufferings, death and resurrection. And so um, if you're answering from the computer screen, you can choose from the word bank, the answer to number one, what do we call the passion, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. And um, if you're answering in your workbook, you would write the answer on page 181. You can pause on the video and write it, or you could write it later. The important thing is that you learn what the Paschal Mystery is. Okay, and um, the next blank here, um, you have different questions in the book and on the computer screen, so I'm going to help with the answers to both of them. So number two is a blank is a sign of grace that gives us God's, God's divine life. Okay, and you probably guessed that one, which is sacrament. Okay, so that would also be in your book, number two, the word sacrament means a sign of grace that gives us God's divine life. Let me just explain a little bit about that because you're getting ready now to receive two sacraments, 
the sacrament of confirmation, and the sacrament of Holy Communion. You've already received two other sacraments. You received baptism and reconciliation, or confession is another name for reconciliation. There are altogether, there are seven sacraments, but um, the other three are sacraments that you would not be receiving until you're older, most likely. I mean, let me name the other three sacraments. The anointing of the sick, all right, that one you could have you could receive at this age if you were if you became very sick or if you had to go into the hospital for something, you could request to be anointed by the priest. That's a sacrament that strengthens us in our illnesses and and fortifies our soul and body. But the other two sacraments are what we call sacrament of vocation, sacraments of vocation, which means of, of life choice. And the most common one of those two is the sacrament of matrimony, which is marriage. So you should pray now that if God is calling you to marriage, that um, God would bless your future husband or future wife. And also the other sacrament is the sacrament of holy orders, which only men can receive because Jesus Christ is the true high priest and men stand in the person of Christ. It's like I, I taught you about how um, sisters in particular stand in the person of the bride of the church, but men stand in the, in the person of the bridegroom. So that's why only a man can be ordained a priest because he, he, men and women have a different role. Each role is very critically important, but, but they're different roles. So a sacrament, there's something visible about every one of the seven sacraments, something you can see. And um, so, but what what's else is happening is invisible. You can't see what God is doing on the inside. Like when you were baptized, water was poured over your head three times and you were baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And you became a child of God, like um, your, your soul became a temple of the Holy Spirit. And you, original sin was washed away from your sin, your soul. So a very big change took place on the inside that couldn't be seen. On the outside, all that could be seen was, was the pouring of the water and then the anointing with chrism. But God was doing something mighty on the inside. And that's the way it is with the sacraments. We, we see on the outside what seems like a very simple thing, like um, you're getting ready to receive Holy Communion, which on the outside just looks like a piece of bread and tastes like bread. And um, every outward appearance just seems like it's bread and wine. But we know from the reality, the power of the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit who overshadowed Mary at the time of the Annunciation, the incarnation when God became a man, that same Holy Spirit the priest calls down when he puts his hands like this, it's called the epiclesis. You, you can see it in the Eucharistic prayer. He calls down the Holy Spirit and over that bread and wine. And the Holy Spirit transforms those gifts into the living body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. That's why I'm so emphasizing that you pray and prepare for this great event. This is a life-changing event that you're about to be confirmed and make your first Holy Communion. God himself is setting up this meeting with you. And so it's something you should never just take for granted or think, um, oh, well, you know, I made my first Holy Communion. God himself um, came to meet you. So if you are using the computer, you can scroll on to the next page and, um, so this, this, the questions are a little bit different in the book and in the computer. Um, the word mystery, in the book, it says the word mystery means. And um, you might, if I asked you what mystery meant, you'd probably say something that you don't know the answer to or something you have to solve. But mystery in this, um, in the sense of sacrament, has a different meaning. And... Um, the original word mysterion, which the word mystery comes from, had the same meaning as sacramentum. It Latin, um, sacramentum was Latin and mysterion was Greek, I believe. But, but they both had the same meaning of conveying the life of God through a visible sign. Like there was something invisible, powerfully going on. God's life was being communicated. And through a simple outward sign. 
And, you know, God could communicate his love without using outward signs, but he knows how we are. And um, if we don't see something or hear it or taste it or touch it, then, you know, we start to think, well, maybe that didn't really happen. And so that's why God makes sure that there's something we can perceive with our senses, with our bodies, that makes us aware of an interior reality that's happening in our souls. God's life is being communicated to us. So, so the word mystery means a visible sign of God's life being given to us. It, it has the same meaning as sacrament in this, in this context. The word Paschal means, now this is a word you wouldn't have known before, but um, uh, the, the word Paschal means Passover. Okay, and you might not have ever heard of the Passover before, so I'm going to briefly explain that to you. The Passover was, it still is a Jewish feast, and we know that the Jewish people are the chosen people of God, the people of the Old Testament whom God formed to prepare for the coming of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, at the time of the incarnation, because Jesus was, was a Jewish man. He was descended from Abraham in the tribe of Judah. So, so um, Jesus loved the Jewish people, and we should also love the Jewish people because our, our, a lot of our Catholic faith, um, the roots of our Catholic faith are in the Jewish faith. But what happened in the time of, I'm going to just give you a brief overview of, of Old Testament history so that you can understand the meaning of Passover, because the, the New Testament, the New Testament relates to Jesus. Um, the Old Testament relates to all the centuries before the coming of Jesus from the time of Adam and Eve up until Jesus Christ was born. So, well, until he was conceived, I should say. So what happened was after Adam and Eve sinned and um, generations went by and God chose another man, he chose a man named Abraham. And he told Abraham to leave his own country and go to the country he would show him. And he said he would make him the father of many nations. And when Abraham was very, very old, he and his wife gave birth to a son, Isaac, and Isaac then later, got, when he got married, he gave birth to two sons, that they were twins, Jacob and Esau. But through Jacob, Jacob was the one chosen by God to, to carry on the, the heritage of the covenant, that the, which a covenant is like a sacred agreement that God had made with Abraham. And Jacob, who was Abraham's grandson, had 12 sons. And from those 12 sons came the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes from which the whole Jewish nation of our own time descend. And so, like I, I told you um, a few minutes ago that Jesus descends from the tribe of Judah. He's called the Lion of Judah. But I, I can't tell you the whole story now because otherwise, <laughs> you know, your parents will shut off the computer or whatever you're listening to because it was so long. But but you should um, really, you know, you should read it when you have time to read the book of Genesis. But what happened was the Jewish people ended up being slaves in Egypt, in the country of Egypt. They were in slavery, the whole nation. Like at that time, there were like 600,000 people in slavery. And Moses was born at that time. And Moses was raised by the Pharaoh's daughter. The Pharaoh was like the king of Egypt. And when he, was in his, when he was about 40 years old, he went to visit his people who were being held in slave, as slaves. And he ended up defending this one man who was being, he was being um, brutally treated by an Egyptian and Moses ended up killing the Egyptian. And then he fled into the desert and he lived in the desert and he got married and he had two sons. But then after 40 years in the desert, God said, God appeared to him in a flaming fire in a bush. And, um, and God said, when Moses said, what is your name? God said, I am who am. And God said he was sending Moses to Egypt because he wanted Moses to lead his people out of slavery in Egypt. 
And so God sent several plagues to Egypt. Plagues are like bad things that happen. Like um, one of them was frogs. Like there were, there were so many frogs in Egypt that you couldn't even like pick up a bowl without a frog jumping into it. And you might think that would be funny, but not if you have too many frogs. And so that was one, and there were 10 plagues altogether, but each one of the plagues God sent was because he was, he was asking the king of Egypt to let his people go out of slavery into freedom. And the king was saying no. And so that was why God kept sending plagues through Moses. But the last plague was the worst one. And the last plague was God said, to Moses, tell all the Israelite people, Israelite means the Jewish people, to take a one-year-old lamb and, and slaughter it and roast it and eat it, but first to take some of the blood from that lamb and put it on the doorposts of their house. And um, that night they were to eat the lamb. And, and then God said, I will send my angel through the land of Egypt and um, when he sees the blood on the door, he will pass over. But, but the, the, the doors that didn't have the blood of the lamb on them, um, the oldest son died in every family. Every Egyptian family, the oldest son in the family died. And, but none of, the, none of the Israelite families, because they all had the blood of the lamb on their door. And that's where the word Passover comes from. The angel of death passed over them. Okay, and that was the foreshadowing of what Jesus was going to do in the Paschal mystery. Because Jesus offered his life on the cross. Jesus, as we know, we call him at the Mass the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. And in Holy Communion, we receive his blood on the doorposts of our house, like our mouth is like the door of our house. And so our bodies and our souls are protected from the angel of death by the blood of the lamb. Now, now that's the angel of death now is referring to Satan, okay, who's trying to lead us to eternal death, which is hell. E eternal death is separation from God for, from, for all eternity. But, but I don't want you to be worried about that because you're going to have the blood of the lamb on your doorpost. You're going to be covered with the blood of the lamb, the precious blood of Jesus Christ, which preserves us from eternal death and helps to preserve us from sin. Now, our Passover is not from, from slavery in Egypt to a free land. Our Passover is from death to eternal life. Okay, the, the Passover of the new covenant is much more powerful than the Passover of the Old Covenant. But I want to just say one thing so that you don't worry about hell, because sometimes when, when people talk about hell, um, people get worried. They think, oh no, I, I'm going to go to hell. But, but pe only the people who want to go to hell go to hell, and, um, because only the people who refuse to receive the mercy of God, God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. In fact, he died on the cross in terrible, excruciating pain so that nobody would make that choice. But, but he gave us free will. And sadly, some people do say no. They say, no, I don't love you, God, and I don't want to be with you. And that's like the worst, worst choice anybody could ever possibly make because it lasts forever. And so we pray. That's why we pray. It's important to go to Mass every single week and um, holy, receive Holy Communion and pray for your family and for the whole world, because the prayers of children are very powerful, that no one, nobody will make that sad choice, because we don't want anyone, no matter how much evil they've done on the earth, we want them to turn back to God and be forgiven so that they can be happy forever in heaven. That should always be our goal, to pray for everybody. So on the computer screen, you see the original Passover was Okay, the freeing of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt by the sacrifice of the lamb. Okay, and if you're doing this in your book, okay, on page 182, um, when the Jews, you could just say when the Jews were freed from slavery. That's the original. Original, remember, means first. The Passover, the new covenant. Now, now this, the new covenant, remembers the time of Jesus, 
was when Jesus gave his life on the cross and paid the price of our sins when we could not. Remember, I told you there's nobody who was worthy to redeem the world. Even our Blessed Mother, who was sinless, could not have redeemed the world because she's only a human person. Jesus is a divine person. He's one of the three divine persons of the Blessed Trinity. So when he took on human nature, he could offer that human nature to the Father through the Holy Spirit. And that's what we do at every Mass. At every Mass, we renew the Paschal mystery because it's the same value as if we were standing on Calvary when Jesus died on the cross and, and then when he rose from the dead. The Mass brings those mysteries into the present time. That's why the Mass is of more value than any other prayer you can pray. Even if you prayed, I think one of the saints said, if you prayed for 600 years without stopping, I mean, nobody could because we don't live that long. And plus, people can't just pray without stopping, <laughs> at least not vocally. It, it, even if that, it wouldn't be worth even one mass, not one, because um, the mass is of infinite value. And so that's why it's so sad when people don't go to mass on Sunday, you, you know, I mean, I mean, right now with the COVID crisis, um, some people are not able to because of their health being very tenuous or whatever. But I'm talking about in regular times, you know, people sometimes choose to sleep instead of to receive the infinite God. And that's a choice that might come back to haunt them someday. So that's why I say to you who are getting ready now to receive Jesus for the first time, don't ever take the gift for granted. This is an eternal infinite gift that every time you receive Jesus, it raises your place in heaven forever, forever. And you're just going to so, be so rejoicing. Like every time you receive Holy Communion, it's like winning the lottery in heaven. You can't compare it with any other gift because you're receiving God himself. That's greater than heaven. You know, I mean, think about it. Okay. So then um, that's the, oh no, we have, I think one more question on this section. Um, we take part in Jesus' sacrifice when we receive the body and blood of Jesus in the Eucharist at Mass. Okay, so that's the Paschal mystery, the mystery of Jesus' passion, death, and resurrection, by which he redeemed all of us. He redeemed the world, and he opened the gates of heaven for us so that we can live forever in heaven in complete happiness if, if we choose to follow him. That's his desire. Now, um, I know you didn't have time, you know, um, I've taught third grade before, so I know those of you who are in third grade, it's not easy to write that fast when you're in third grade. So you can go back and fill in the answers after if you're not able to keep up with this pace. I completely understand that. Okay, um, now uh, if you're in the book on page 183, okay, this is the Paschal Mystery Word Search. And you'll see that um, on the computer, it, it gives, it's set up a little bit differently on the computer. Um, it gives you the word bank um, and then the questions. And it's not even as many questions on the computer as it is in the book. But for those of you who are doing it in the book, if you look on page 184, you'll see all the answers are there, okay, at the top of the page there. Pascal, Rose, Grace, Mystery, Ascension, Passover, death, sacrament, and covenant. Okay, so those are the answers that you can use to fill in the blanks. And um, let's look at the computer screen first and then we'll do the um, other blanks. Okay, so Jesus blank on the cross and his resurrection saved us from sin and death. Okay, so Jesus is death on the cross. Okay, and Jesus really did die on the cross. Um, in his human nature. We, we already talked about how God can't die, so his divine nature didn't die, but his human nature really did. And death is the separation of the soul and the body. So his soul, his human soul, separated from his body and remained separated until the third day, until Sunday morning when they were reunited and he rose from the dead in the power of the Holy Spirit. So his death was a real death and his suffering was real suffering. You know, that's important to emphasize because some people think, oh, he was God. So it didn't really hurt. Yes, it did. It hurt probably more than it would have hurt us because um, 
of the perfection of his body and the perfection of his emotions. The original Passover was when the Israelites escaped from slavery in Egypt. Okay, because on that day when I told you how the firstborn sons died and the blood of the lamb protected the Israelites, they left Egypt and they, they went into the desert. And um, after they'd been in the desert for a long time, they went into the promised land, which is um, the present country of Israel at the east of the Mediterranean Sea is the same land that they were um, given by God. The word mystery originally, originally meant the same thing as sacrament. Okay, and um, that's all. I mean, then there's a word search that you can do later on. Um, on the computer, or that you can do it in your book. It's on page one. Probably be easier to do it in the book, I guess. But let's look at the answers to the questions on page 183, because I want to make sure that you have those correct. Okay, and you can um, write them in later if, if I go a little bit too fast for you. Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection saved us from sin and death. Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension are called the uh, the Paschal Mystery. That's what this section is about, the Paschal Mystery. Remember, Paschal means the same thing as Passover. The original Passover was when the Israelites escaped from slavery in Egypt. And the word, what word meant the same thing as sacrament? Mystery. The Paschal Mystery brings about a new covenant between God and man. Now that's the word I haven't taught you about before, but a covenant is a sacred agreement. Like when a man and woman receive the sacrament of matrimony, when they're married, they make a covenant, a sacred agreement before God to be faithful to one another. It's, it's a very, very powerful thing to be in a covenant relationship. We are in a covenant relationship with God from the time of our baptism. Jesus rose from the dead on the third day. I know you've got that one right. The is when Jesus returned to heaven. All right, that's the ascension, when Jesus ascended into heaven and is now sitting at the right hand of the Father. A sacrament is a sign of God's grace that gives us God's divine life. And grace is the free gift of God's divine life within us. So we sanctifying grace is the grace that of God's abiding presence in our souls, which we first receive at our baptism. And it's increased every time we receive a sacrament worthily. We should never receive um, Holy Communion if, we, if we're aware of having a mortal sin on our soul. Mortal sin means a serious sin that we know is serious and we did anyways. That would be um, something that we can talk about in another class. But you can always be forgiven for a mortal sin by going to, to the sacrament of confession. You should never be afraid of confessing any sin because the priest has heard worse sins than yours. And the and, um, priest is not going to start yelling at you because of the sins that you've committed. He's happy that you're coming back to union with Jesus. Okay, so um, the last part of this we're going to talk about now is um, what's called the memorial acclamation. Okay, and this memorial acclamation is a part of the Mass that you probably um, have noticed before. It's at the end of the Eucharistic prayer. Well, not, not the end, but it's actually right after, it's more like in the middle. It's right after the consecration. So usually the bell will ring when the priest elevates the host and consecrates the bread into the body of Christ, when he elevates the chalice of wine and consecrates it into the blood of Christ. Now remember that they'll still have the same appearance and taste. They have all the outward appearances of bread and wine, but the reality has changed. That's called transubstantiation, a very big word, which means the substance has changed. It's no longer bread and wine. It's now the living Christ under the appearance of bread and wine. So right after that, we pray what's called the memorial acclamation. And sometimes the choir sings it, or sometimes we recite it. But there's three different choices of um, memorial acclamation. So you've probably heard all three of these at one time or another. So let's read them together. Option one, 
We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Save us, Savior of the world, for by your cross and resurrection, you have set us free. Okay, now in your workbook, you're going to have two questions that go with each one of these options, two questions to answer. Okay, those of you who are doing it on the computer, it's a little bit different for you. So I'd like to answer the questions that are in the workbook first, and then, um, then we will finish up this particular class. So in the workbook on page 185, it says, to proclaim is to tell others about something. This is, we're talking about option one now. To profess is to say what we believe. In this prayer, what do we proclaim and profess? Okay, so it tells us, we proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection. Okay, so we're pro proclaiming Christ's death on the cross, the importance of his crucifixion, because it redeemed the world. And we believe in your resurrection. We know that you rose from the dead on the third day. Um, we, what, do we, what do we believe will happen at the end of time? That Christ will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. Okay, then for option two, we have two questions for option two. How do we proclaim Christ's death? It says, when we eat this bread and drink this cup. So in other words, when we receive the body and blood of Christ under the appearance of bread and wine. What do we believe will happen at the end of time? Jesus will come again until you come again. And for option three, there's three questions here. What do we ask of the Savior of the world? Save us, Savior of the world. We, we pray to be saved. How are we set free? By your cross and resurrection. And what are we set free from? We're set free from sin and death, eternal death, which is like we talked about before, eternal death is hell, but eternal life is heaven. Okay, so those of you who are um, doing this on the computer, there's a few questions here that go with that. We pro you just have to fill in the blanks. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Okay, then we have, um, okay, I don't think I can scroll on to the next, next part of the computer scene. It's not allowing me to go over there. Okay, so what, what would be the closing thing of this is you can make um, a banner of one, if you want to, you can color a banner of one of these options of one of these memorial acclamations, just as a way to learn more about it and um, to think of how beautiful it is. So I can read the last screen now. It's um, save us, savior of the world, for by your cross and resurrection, you have set us free. Okay, so we're going to close um, our session on the Paschal Mystery and um, you can fill in um, your workbooks or do the work on the computer, whichever is easier for you. And then um, next time we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit. So in a particular way, we'll be getting ready for confirmation in our next session. So let's close by praying the Our Father together, which we call the Lord's Prayer, because it was the Lord Jesus who gave us the words of the Our Father. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much and God bless you all.